why like you know, I, there's a lot of muslim countries mm -hmm. but like you know if you look okay so turkey is not the same as like saudi arabia you know mm -hmm. it's and like you, you also have the sunnis and the, and the shiites if they're all mm -hmm. muslims why aren't they all like the same why don't yeah. like Tur turkish people or whatever yeah it's a know, great question like women in saudi arabia like why it's a great question so uh, this is an attestation to one of the hadiths, which is the uh, teachings of the prophet, peace be upon him, when he says that every generation after me, their Islam will be less and less. Now, didn't he have soldiers? You just, I think you've gone pretty fast. The soldiers will, uh, jinn or something like that? Isn't jinn something bad? No, not necessarily. So you have Muslim jinn and you have other forms of jinn. Now, who who um, who wrote what you were reading? So uh, the <laughs> author is God Himself. Now, in regards to the scribes of the Prophet Isa uh, Salam, there's a wonderful book here that I recommend to you. And okay. here it's called "The Scribes of the Prophet." Okay. What do you think about the solar eclipse happening now? I know about the lunar and the solar eclipse happening during Ramadan. Is that's a major thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No, not necessarily. So uh, we have an instance where, uh, in the life of the Prophet Islam, peace be upon him, uh, his son died. And... Hello. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Hi. Why is Solomon talking, uh, spending so much time with an ant? Well, he's not. He's he's not spending so much time with an ant at all. So he's marching his army across the field, and he acknowledges the ant. So he acknowledges the conversation that's happening between the queen ant and uh, the rest of the colony. That seems well. That's kind of that's a little. Why? Why does he do that? Right, so uh, couple, there's a couple pieces of wisdom there. Uh, the first one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the ability to communicate with creatures outside of human beings, right? He also gave him the power of the winds, right? Okay. So the miracles that were conducted by various prophets, these uh, Solomon just so happened to be conducting this type of miracle. Now, the wisdom that's extracted from that is it shows that ants have a language and they have the ability to communicate. So it's from us to learn and to reflect that if the Quran was false and it made this wisdom known that the ants have the ability to communicate, but then modern science comes to the conclusion that they do not have a language and they do not have an ability to communicate you would have a falsification test against the Quran. Does that make sense? Well, maybe. Okay. Now, didn't he have soldiers? You just, I think you've gone pretty fast. The soldiers will, uh, jinn or something like that? Isn't jinn something bad? No, not necessarily. So you have Muslim jinn and you have other forms of jinn. So jinn have uh, free will, just like we have free will. So, for example, uh, when you have the creation of the first man, Adam, he was uh, in an assembly, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels to prostrate. And he also says that uh, of the angels that prostrated, that they followed the command. However, a jinn by the name of Iblis did not follow the command. So what that tells us is, and then in the segment of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I know what you conceal and I know what you reveal. So what this tells us is jinn have the ability to choose whether or not they want to obey or not. And Iblis, or how we know him as Satan, right? We know him by name, which is Iblis. He chose to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he argued saying you created me from fire you created him from clay and i'm better than him mm -hmm. right yeah so now in this in that same sense 
you have other gin kind that have a choice, just like we have a choice of submitting to the creator or not. And in this instance, these jinn that were in servitude to Solomon were submissive. All right. So the jinn are, jinn are people or not? No, they are not people. Yeah. So they are created from a smokeless flame. They are their own creation. Okay. And it's to our understanding that these jinn are uh, a creation before us. So Iblis was around before mankind was around. So if they're good, why don't they call them angels? Well, because we have a differentiation between an angel and a jinn. So angels do not have free will, right? And they are different types of beings. We are, to us, it's known that they are created as beings of pure light that cannot disobey any command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But jinn, just like we are created from a form of clay, mm -hmm. uh, they are created from a smokeless flame. So the recipe for their existence is entirely different than an angel. Now, we don't know whether or not they have certain characteristics like hands or you know, eyes or something like that. But what we do know is they have the capacity to see. You can extract that from the story here, such as when the jinn stands up and says, I'll get the throne for you. And he clearly knew which way to go in order to get to that throne. But to say that they have eyes to see is a stretch because we don't have that type of information. It's not privy to us. Yeah. But keep in mind, this is uh, part of the realm of the unseen. Okay. So uh, although that it can be very interesting, right? Um, it is it, like proceed down that route with caution because you you know you have people out there that communicate with jinn uh, but they don't necessarily know whether or not it's a good one or a bad one right now okay. the way that you can tell if it's a good one or a bad one mm -hmm. is if you were to and by no means am i encouraging you to establish any form of communication with them but we know for a fact that they do exist if it was a good one then they would uh obviously highly likely not respond, right? Uh, because they're not interested in causing any type of misguidance. If they're in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they themselves know and probably have other criteria within their realm mm -hmm. to protect themselves and protect their form of belief. The people that end up communicating with these bad jinn are ones that are gonna deviate you away from the truth. Now know that it's not a, um, a matter of creed in order for you to be upon belief to establish communication with these jinn at all. So uh, if you don't mind me asking, uh, what do you believe in and why do jinn interest you so much? No, they don't. It's just kind of something that caught my attention. Certainly, yeah. But I what, mean, what, it is go ahead. What is their purpose? Why were they created? For the same purpose that we were created. They were created for the purpose of serving and being in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, they could also be created for the purposes of a trial for us. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that he did not create jinn kind and mankind except for the purposes of serving him. Now, the way in which you serve him okay. is to maintain that path of righteousness, conduct good deeds, good actions, be good to your neighbor, and follow the rules and the decrees that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid down, both in the sense of uh, exercising the good ones and avoiding the bad, right? Okay. So if these jinn were given a condition to avoid certain bad and they... Uh, act upon 
these bad, then they're not in a state of obedience and they will be punished for it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that the fuel of hellfire is jinn and men. Right? Okay. Meaning both both types of creations are going to be hold, held to an account. Okay. Now, who who um who wrote what you were reading? So uh, the <laughs> author is God himself. Now, in regards to the scribes of the Prophet, uh, there's a wonderful book here that I recommend to you. And okay. here it's called The Scribes of the Prophet. Okay. And in here, uh, you have a detailed account of 50 of the companions uh, that scribe down the Quran. So, so you call them, so the scribes and not like prophets? I'm trying to like, no. uh, I know the Bible. I'm trying to like make it make sense to me. To attach sure. to what I wrote, but it's, it's not going that way. <laughs> no problem, no problem. So let me give you the basics, right? So as a Muslim, we believe in Prophet Muhammad as being the final prophet. We right. also believe in all of the previous messengers and prophets. So like David, Solomon, Jesus, Moses, Adam, we okay. believe in all of them and we love them. Uh, we revere them. We hold them to an extremely high status as honored individuals because they were honored with prophethood. Uh, we just do not worship any one of them. Okay. 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 Now, we believe that all of these prophets were Muslim. And Muslim, the word comes from the Arabic root word istislam, which means to submit. So we believe that Adam submitted to God, mm -hmm. Moses submitted to God, Jesus submitted to God, and so on and so on and so on. And this chain was unaltered, and the message was unaltered. The message of Tawheed, which is pure monotheism. Okay. So all of these messengers came in, and they preached pure monotheism and submission to Allah, which translates as the only deity worthy of worship. They attributed all the miracles to him. They okay. attributed all the wonders, all the help. They attributed all of the positive things to him. Now, for where we stand and why it's relevant to you is because the Quran claims that it is a that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, is a mercy for all of the worlds. Mm -hmm. And he's supposed to withstand the test of time until the day of judgment. So his message is specifically for you Whereas contrary to something like Christianity that was meant specifically for the Jews. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. So now the idea is that if you're opening up a copy of the Quran, this is what you would classify as the last revelation. Right? Okay. Okay. Now we believe and we have evidences that the Quran has not been corrupted has not been altered and has been fully preserved from the time of the prophet, uh, peace be upon him, until today. So contrary to the other books that either have some type of an addition, omission, or alteration, the Quran does not contain this. And if you are somebody that believes in the existence of one God, mm -hmm. and if you are somebody that believes in the existence of his messengers, and if you have not been uh, exposed to the message of Islam, then I encourage you to pick up a copy of the Quran, and I'm happy to send a copy your way so that you can read it. See what the contents of the message are. See if it makes sense. And then I would like to invite you to accept Islam uh, with no compulsion, but it has to be of your own free volition. And as long as you're within sound mind to make that decision. So there isn't different versions of the uh, Quran, Quran? So uh, what do you mean by versions? The different versions. Like, you know, there's different versions of the, um, depending on who translates it, of the Bible, there's different, you know. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have different, uh, we have different translations. So, for example, uh, I'm reading the Sahih International. This mm -hmm. is a translation. 
However, by the Quran itself is in Arabic, and there is no different versions of the Quran. You have seven styles or seven uh, ways of revelation, which are the seven ahruf. And I covered this in a previous video, but I'm happy to send you a link to it. But in regards to if the version that you're thinking of, so like, let's say, for example, if you look at the Bible and it has 66 books and then another version has 72 and another one had 78 and stuff like that. No, we don't have that. No. The Quran is exactly the way that it was from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, until today. And that is one of the key differentiators as to why I accepted Islam in comparison to when I was reading my Bible. Uh, there are certain things with Christianity that just, they didn't make sense to me and I couldn't get a resolve for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. What do you think about the solar eclipse happening now? I know about the Luna and the solar eclipse happening during Ramadan. Is That's a major thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No, not necessarily. So uh, we have an instance where uh, in the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, his son died and there was an eclipse that happened. And one of the attestations of him not being a deceiver is when the people around him said, oh, look, uh, there's a there's a miraculous and by miraculous to them, they meant like wondrous event was taking place. And they said, this must be because of the passing of the prophet's son. And the prophet stood up and said, no, this is just another wonder of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows these wonders in the universe, but it has nothing to do with the passing of my son, uh, nor the death of anybody else. So my thought process on the eclipse is uh, to directly answer your question is that it's a wonderful sign of the order that is established by the creator in the universe that we live in, uh, along with many other things from, you know, the birth of children to the development of psychology to the adaptation of language to black holes existing to shooting stars. These are all wonders. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a sign that the Mahdi is coming or something like that, the Iman Mahdi is coming? No. Well, you know, there's a lot of crazy things going on with the red heifers and all this stuff. So I'm just... Yeah, there's a, I'll tell you, um, you know, for somebody that's been uh, reflecting a lot about what's happening in the world, uh, there is a lot of craziness. I do agree with you on that. Uh, to in total, I agree with you. And I think that a lot of people are going to try to find opportunities, not only to get relevant, but to stay relevant. And they're going to discuss and speculate things. Uh, however, you know, we have a, a sound understanding of the way that things are supposed to transpose. And to us, the Prophet, uh, salam, peace be upon him, said that you shouldn't really be worried so much about the day of judgment happening or not. Rather, it's what you prepare for it. And it doesn't matter really what you prepare if you're upon disbelief, because according to the Quran, uh, if you are not somebody that believes in the message of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and you're not somebody that believes in Allah, Almighty God, then really um, you're going to be in trouble on that day. Well, what if, what if you never got a chance to learn about it? And it's not your fault. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And uh, Islam does have an answer for that as well. So for the people that have never been introduced to proper Islam, meaning let's say that they were just some aboriginal tribe mm -hmm. and there was a message uh, that never got there, either because the tribe was undiscovered or for some reason or another, you know, a messenger, the, it just the messages didn't reach them. Now, in this circumstance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give them a separate trial on the Day of Judgment, and their trial is going to be unique. And what this trial is, is they're going to be faced with a challenge, 
And the challenge is going to be one of belief or disbelief. So trust or not trust. When they're there on the day of account, they're going to be witnessing the angels. They're going to be witnessing all of creation. And they're also going to be witnessing their creator. Their creator is going to try them by telling them to step into a lake of fire. If they see all of these things and they themselves uh, ignore the instruction of the creator, then uh, unfortunately they're not going to pass the test. But based on my personal reflection, um, I think that what they have is easy because where you and I have to use our reasoning faculties to come to our conclusion and we have to explore religions categorically, uh, they are going to be seeing things which you and I are not privy to seeing. So, for example, the Prophet Ali Sam said that the closest people to me are the ones that believe in me but never saw me. Because it was very easy for the times of the companions when revelation would come down over the course of 23 years and they would be living that life and seeing the things unfold in front of their faces. So to give you an example, one of the uncles of the prophet, and this is a way that you can again try to falsify the Quran, he died upon disbelief. And there was a revelation about him in the Quran. And for 10 years, this revelation existed while this uncle was alive. And this revelation said that he would die upon disbelief. So all he had to do to disprove the Quran was to even fake being a believer, just to die as a hypocrite. But he died as a disbeliever. So sometimes even the people closest to him and the people that witnessed him and that what we would consider their test, you know, to be a little bit easier kind of retrospectively, they still died upon disbelief. But to directly answer your question, if there was some Aboriginal tribe, they would basically be giving a different test on the day of judgment. Because remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he is not unjust and not even by an atom's weight will injustice be administered or conducted to any of his creation. So what if you've heard about it, but you, it's, um, okay, I don't want to offend you. <laughs> no, 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 you're not going to offend me. It's, it's, a, it's a good discussion. It doesn't seem like, um, uh, I don't know how to say this without opinions. Okay. Why would I want to follow a religion that goes and like, just, you know, what happened in Israel? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're shooting yeah. in people not you but you know and then in, in moscow i mean why would how would that what would make me think that that is a religion of god mm -hmm. yeah so what i would encourage you to do is to take a look at and, and categorically separate the religion of islam from even uh muslims themselves right so for example the muslim that you should be looking to <laughs> is the prophet as an example you can't look at a society and say this is islam so uh if i may just for a moment speak about my own journey okay. you know i used to be an atheist right and when i was exploring religion uh i said to myself i'm going to look at the test objectively i'm not going to take a look at my own social influences and the things that i see either on the media or from my immediate sphere of influence, like friends, family, and all the things that impacted my psychology growing up, right? Mm -hmm. So what I said was, is I'm going to develop just small categories, meaning as an example, there can only be one God, there can't be more than one, otherwise there'd be a power struggle, right? Okay. One would say, hey, we're going to go east. The other one says, no, we're going to go west. One would say, we're going to start creation on this day. The other one says, no, we're going to start creation on this day. And you can see how there could be chaos, right? Yep. So what that does categorically now is it removes a lot of the religions on the table. Instead of going through 8,000 of them, 
now I only have to go through maybe 10, right? Because yeah. no one's going to spend 8,000 on a lifetime, right? Right. Now, in regards to another category is I cannot look at the people. Rather, I have to look at what the scripture says. Okay. Yeah. So then if you were to open up the Quran and it says that if you are to kill an innocent individual, it's as if you've killed all of mankind. Okay. And then likewise, on the same token, if you are to save an individual, it's as if you have saved all of mankind. And even though that there's verses of war in the Quran, if you look at them contextually, you will see that these are verses of defense. These are verses where you have the ability to fight back in the form of aggression. Mm -hmm. Now, how is that related to your question in regards to what's happening in Israel? Well... First and foremost, if these people were following Islam, mm -hmm. and if these people were Muslim, and if these people were under oppression mm -hmm. for many years, right? I don't know if you're familiar with the Balfour Declaration and the establishment of Israel and how it came to be as far as an occupier in regards to the negotiations that happened with Great Britain at the time and Lord Balfour. No, I basically didn't, i didn't say i was on their side either so <laughs> no 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 i understand but it's it's important to lay the foundation down that way that you can see what's what is actually happening and i encourage you to take a look at some of these things and now you'll 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 have a um more of a unbiased picture right of what what is transpiring but remember What's important is what Islam says. So if Islam says that you cannot harm innocents, if Islam says there needs to be a due process, if Islam says that the creator is the ultimate judge and that you should take a path of peace, and if Islam says you have the right to defend yourself, now if this sounds okay to you, then you don't have an issue with Islam. You have an issue with a sequence of events that are transpiring to a people that are oppressed and you have uh, casualties on both sides, right? Okay. So that's what I would, I would encourage you to take that angle when you're studying religions or when you're exploring religions uh, and you can see what the actual creed is and what the positional stance is from what we believe to be a revelation from Almighty God. Okay. Now, if, if for some reason you find a religion that says, hey, uh, you got to go out there and pillage, plunder, and steal, and you know, commit all sorts of atrocities, well, if you're someone that sided with that, then we just know what kind of character you are. Gotcha. Okay. Right? But the question is not offensive at all. It's actually a very, very common question. So I'd encourage you to see what Islam actually says in regards to the preservation of life, the preservation of chastity, the honoring of people, uh, the preservation of peace, the elimination of trials, what we call fitna, which is basically trials and tribulations, uh, the preservation of relationships with your neighbor, preservation of uh, family bonds, the preservation of um, taking care of the destitute, the poor, orphans, widows, you know, these are all things that are covered in the Quran. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question. You can ask as many as you wish. Why, like, you know, I, there's a lot of Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, if you look, okay. So, Turkey is not the same as, like, Saudi Arabia. You know, mm -hmm. it's... And like you also have the Sunnis and the and the Shiites. If they're all Muslims, why aren't they all like the same? Why don't yeah. like Tur Turkish people or whatever? Yeah, it's a know, great question. Like women in Saudi Arabia, like why? It's a great question. So uh, this is an attestation to one of the hadiths, which is the uh, teachings of the Prophet peace be upon him, when he says that every generation after me their Islam will be less and less, right? And he tells us in another authentic hadith that we will be many, but we will be weak 
almost like foam, like whitewash on a on a seashore, right? And he tells us that other countries would be dining upon us as if we're there around a dinner table taking us piece by piece, right? And this is because people have um, strayed far away from where they're supposed to be in regards to uh, their deen, which is the way of life, which is Islam. Okay. And he tells us this because th this is a consequence of people's hearts having a love for this world and a fear of death. So what that means is they have a love for the material things and they have a love for the status quo and they fear the day of account when they're going to be facing their Lord. And if you were to encompass all of these teachings, then you will see how uh, there is a, uh, a desire to want to preserve what people have without actually having the courage to stand up for what's just. But if you take a look at what it says in the Quran, it says that in regards to justice, not only should you stand up to oppression, but you should stand up for justice, even if it means going against your own, your own blood family. So how does this relate to your question? Simply put, Muslims in all countries that have not stood up in one way or another, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, gives us a way to stand up. So for example, if you can do something with your body, act. If you can't do something with your body, do something with your voice. If you can't do something with your voice, do something to empower others, such as a monetary aid and so on. These people have lost their courage. And that is because they love the status quo and they have gone far away. So now what, when you see things such as the Muslim countries or the so-called Muslim countries, unfortunately, Islam doesn't necessarily have borders and there is no such thing as a Muslim country because in order for there to be an authentic Muslim country, there needs to be a, something called a caliphate established. Okay. But what we do have, though, is we have Muslims that are both weak and we have Muslims that are strong. And the ones that are strong are standing up to this oppression and they are standing up to injustice in the means that they are capable of doing so, for example, you know, I volunteer a lot. I send a lot of aid. I do a lot of things, which I don't I don't want to use it as a brag session. But there's a lot of things happening in grassroots movements. And I see a lot of Muslims on the forefront that are uh, making syndications and alliances and sending aid and doctors and everybody's doing the things that they can. But in regards to the politics, this is where it's challenging. And the reason being is because the politicians are looking at preserving the status quo and then they have their own battles that they need to fight. And whatever their battle is, unfortunately, you and I won't understand it. But fortunately for you and me, we're not going to be the ultimate judge of their actions. Rather, if they would just come back to the conclusion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, is going to be the one to judge them. That's why you have certain politicians that are standing up even within their own ranks and saying enough is enough and we have to do something about this. But you can take it even a step further. It's not just about Muslims standing up for other Muslims, but we are obligated by Islam to fight all forms of oppression. So to me, it's a very saddened state of affairs that not only the atrocities that happen with the Uyghurs, but also the atrocities that are happening right now with my brothers and sisters in Gaza, Palestine, and so on. We have not stood up for the oppression of people that are outside the fold of Islam, because this is the true Islam. So now, to us, this is a trial, and we need to learn a serious lesson from this in banding together and helping people of all walks of life, because this is what the Quran instructs us to do. So to us, this is a big failure, uh, or at least to me, this is a big failure, reflectively speaking. And now this is a consequence because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that 
all of the actions that have done that are transpiring are things that we have brought upon ourselves with our own hands. So if we were strong to the point where we were supposed to be strong, we would have been standing up to oppression everywhere. And people would know that if there was oppression going on anywhere, the Muslims would have our backs. But we have not only failed our own people, we have failed everybody else to some capacity or another. Yeah. Okay. And I wish it wasn't the case. I really wish it wasn't the case. But again, this is why I encourage you to take a look at the Quran and mm -hmm. you will see what its position is, meaning what the Islamic position is by divine decree on events like this. And that is what would help you choose. So even though that you're seeing these events go on in, uh, in the world, I don't want you to think that that is Islam. I want you to see from the source what Islam is. And you can only get that from reading the Quran and studying the life, uh, the biography and the teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Anything else is a deviation. Anything else is only going to give you some type of, of dilution. Yes. So even if you took a look at the companions, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. They were the closest to the Prophet, peace be upon him, right? But uh, and they did their absolute very best, but they themselves are not the prophet and they themselves are not a lost pound powder, right? So they followed the rules and the laws and that's why there was so much harmony at their time. There was basically peace across the entire Islamic empire at the time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm happy to send you a copy of the Quran uh, if you want, just feel free to email me. It's dawadigest at gmail.com. And, you know, um, obviously you're an English speaker, so it'll be easy. But I encourage you, as you go through your journey, uh, you know, set a look, at, set some objective criteria for yourself, such as I, the same thing that I did. That way that you don't, um, you don't get uh, booby-trapped by the shaitan. Because remember, his primary goal is to keep you away from the truth. And he's going to use all forms of methodologies to do that, whether it be distraction, procrastination, emotional bombardment, you know, you name it. But his tactics, if you if you look at the Quran, his tactics don't change. Okay. His tactics have remained the same since the dawn of time. Okay. Great. Anything else that I can feel for you today? Um, no. <laughs> no. All right. I, I welcome you back anytime. You know, you're very pleasant to speak to. And, you know, I'll be doing these readings uh, pretty much throughout the night. Um, so we have uh, about, uh, I think it's about 10 more sections to go, but you're welcome to come on afterwards. And I welcome you to join me. And I put the series out there. And if you want, you can listen to it on the radio or excuse me, not on the radio, but you could listen to it on your drives and so on. And so hopefully my voice doesn't get too annoying. <laughs> is there like, um, cause what you were reading sounded really, really confusing. Is there something like easier to start with? <laughs> yeah, of course. So, uh, what I was doing is I was actually, um, alternating between what's called the tafsir and the Quran. So the Quran is the Quran, very simple, very easy to read. The tafsir on the other hand is a scholarly work on the exegesis of certain verses, and that can be in depth. Uh, so the easiest thing really is to get a copy of that Quran. I have found that this Sahih International is pretty good, right? It does a very good job of expunging on the meaning of the Arabic because the Quran is in Arabic and it's tough sometimes to take an English translation and to get the same essence to the Arabic because Arabic is a very rich language. You can have an entire description of something be put in one word, right? So um, this particular one, uh, so this is what it's titled, if you wanna look it up on Amazon. Okay, got it. Okay. okay. And um, this is a really good one. There's another very good one. Let me see if I can just locate it for you uh, very quickly. And I found it to be incredibly helpful. Um,
So uh, it is by, um, it's a translation by Abdul Halim. And here's a link for it. I'll put the link in the private chat for you. Yeah. And once again, you know, I'm, uh, don't spend money on it. I'm happy to, to purchase it for you because a lot of the people, the donors to my channel and so on, this is where all the funding goes. Uh, and we believe that Islam is free. So like, I don't want you to, to spend money if you don't, if you don't want to, um, but it's in the private chat there for you. Okay. And it's a, it's a beautiful parallel, super, super easy to read. Doesn't have any of the archaic text or anything like that, but, um, it, it may look thick, but it's just because it contains both the Arabic and the English. Okay. Yeah. But again, feel free to email me. Um, and there's the email for you. And I'm sure all of the people that are uh, my donors will be very happy because to them, this is a big honor and a reward uh, for every letter that you read and every uh, ounce of knowledge that you increase, um, they get a part of that reward. So they, they appreciate stuff like this. Well, I, I like learning, so I'll definitely, okay, I'll take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're most welcome. And, you know, in the Quran, it tells you straight up, uh, it's incumbent on you to seek knowledge and don't trust your forefathers. Don't trust me. Um, just go and seek knowledge for yourself, conduct the research, come to your conclusions with the only condition is just be sincere, right? If you're sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of the rest. If you're insincere, he'll take care of the rest, you know? So that's it. That's the only criterion, right? Okay. All right. All right, Randy, I'll let you go. You're most welcome back anytime. Okay, uh, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Stay blessed. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're most welcome. Okay. Bye. -bye.